Hi, my name is Chrissy Reichert. I attend Indiana State University and I'm in the Doctorate in Athletic Training program. Today I'll be talking with you about neurodynamics. All right, let's talk a little bit about the breakdown of a nerve. First of all, we want to focus on the axon since that's what's relaying the, the signals. An axon is directly covered by a myelin sheath. Now, not all, not all axons and nerves have myelin sheaths, and they do tend to break down. You can see that in a number of diseases, but in our case, we're going to go ahead and describe an axon as being covered by the myelin sheath. So each of these axons with their myelin sheath, also known, as a, also known as a nerve fiber, is covered by a layer called the endonerium. Now, when you take multiple of these, um, fat, these fibers together, it makes up one fascicle. So you can see that is the red um, in that diagram, and it's covered by the endonerium. And then each fascicle is then covered by a, the perineerium. So that is going to be, um, the group of them is going to be the green, as you can see. So you've got a group of fascicles that's going to be covered by the perineerium. And then bundles of fascicles, so you put these big bundles of fascicles together by the perineerium, and they're all going to be covered by the epineurium, which is the outermost, which is the purple part in this layer, or in this diagram. Um, and then when you think about all those layers, the body contains thousands of nerves, so that's a lot that's going on. Um, so that's just kind of the breakdown of a nerve, um, and we're going to go on from there. All right, so nerve movement. Now, nerves are subject to mechanical stress that causes strains, just like bones and ligaments and muscles. Now, remember, the stress is the act of it, and the strain is the physiological effect that occurs because of the stress. It does cause a displacement, no, most notably measured in millimeters, of the nerve relative to the nerve bed itself. So that's also termed excursion. So the movement of the nerve away from the nerve bed is called excursion. When it's elongated, the nerve glides towards the moving joint, and that's called convergence. But when it's shortened, the nerve glides away from the moving joint, called divergence. So let's take a little bit of an example. So the ulnar nerve, um, it experiences convergence with elbow extension, meaning that it is, oh, excuse me, these are backwards, um, but the ulnar nerve experiences divergent in elbow extension because to stretch the ulnar nerve, you want to put that elbow into flexion. So these are actually backwards, so I apologize for that. So for those of you who are listening, um, so that's just an example of the body and the, how it can work and how the nerves move. Now levels of strains that a nerve can withstand is dependent on several factors. So the greater the nerve compliance or the greater movement, it occurs with nerves that cross multiple joints, which makes sense, right? If you are crossing both the shoulder and the elbow, it's going to be more inclined to move since you've got two different joints that it's moving with. Longer nerves are more compliant than shorter ones. Again, that makes sense to us because the longer the nerve, the more um, Ligament are the more, um, excuse me, the joints it crosses, um, so you are going to have um, more movement. And finally, decreased movement, or also known as increased stiffness, is when the nerve is moved, yeah, happens when the nerve is moved very quickly. So to get that elongation, that healthiness of um, elongating the nerve, you want to do that very slowly because mu the, the nerves will stiffen up if you start moving them quickly. Um, and physiologically, nerve movement does increase blood flow and it decreases adhesions. And overall, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but it depends on the acute and chronic stage and kind of what we're going to be using. But we'll get that into that a little bit later. So physical stress theory is a theory that states that the level of physical stress placed on a tissue dictates the adaptive response, right? That makes sense. We think of the bones and the muscles and we know those rules. We know Wolf's Law. Now, a physical stress that is lower than the required levels for maintenance will cause a decreased ability to adapt and tolerate stress. Now, first, I was a little confused about that, but it turns out that's a mobilization. If you're going to mobilize that joint, um, you're going to have that stiffness. That makes sense. So when you do start to do rehab, you're not going to be able to tolerate movement quite as fast or quite as much. Physical stress in range will cause no tissue adaptation, right? You don't stress the muscle. It's just going to stay the same. You're not going to stress the nerve. It's just not going to stay the same. Physical stresses over the normal range will increase tolerance and adaptations will occur, which makes sense, right? Progressive overload. However, if you do physical stress over the capacity um, that that tissue can withstand, you're going to have injury. 
and then physical stresses that are extreme will cause the nerve death. So how much is too much? Um, literature states that slow elongation is recommended, so about one, one millimeter a day, which is not saying much, but a little can mean a lot. Six to eight percent of lengthening over short duration is derm is te is excuse me is healthy. Um, Eleven percent increase is just too much. Therefore, slow and gradually increasing in rehabilitation is going to be the key. So, like I said, when you're especially when you're injured, um, that stress is going to increase, and you're not going to be as sensitive um, and be able to adapt as quickly. Compressive forces cause damage after about 15 millimeters of hydrogen maintained for two minutes. So think about desk work. You see a lot of people with carpal tunnel when they have um, pressure on the mouse and a lot of research is done around carpal tunnel to show that the amount of compressive forces that happen during the um, during just the daily activity. Also we can see it in like tennis players you're having that um, the, the grip is causing the um, hook of the hamate to be pressed against. A lot of times that can cause ulnar pain or nerve pain, excuse me. And then we just look at 10 days of compressive forces results in 38% demyelinization. And that is, so think about those athletes that are doing that every day or doing those, the people that are working on computers all day long. And vibrations also are known as repetitive stress and it's shown to decrease sensory and grip strength. So think about I remember one time when I was in high school, we did a fundraiser and we cleaned a lot of the, um, the buildings in our community and I used a pressure washer and that vibrates. And my hands felt so weird yesterday, I, yesterday, <laughs> felt so weird um, the next day because of that, the vibration sustained over time. So think about people who were doing that for um, their work. So next we're going to go into neural tension, and that's used to understand how nerves move in relation to surrounding tissue. And that has led to the development of neural tension tests, which are movements in order to understand the tension of a nerve. Now neural tension does imply abnormal conduction or sensory impairment, so um, a lot of literature is changing to adverse mechanical tension instead of neural tension because that adverse mechanical tension, also known as AMT, um, just implies that there's an abnormality in the tissue or um, the mechanical stresses that happens along the nerve, but may not cause sensory impairments. So neural tension tests, so overall there are evaluation techniques that aim to produce symptoms or use to elongate or rehabilitate a nerve. So think about like beginning athletic training classes, we've all seen the slump test or the straight leg race test, and these are all used to find out if the nerve is involved, if it's a reproduction of symptoms. So here in this picture we see the slump test, which includes neck flexion, uh, trunk flexion, extension of the knee, and then the dorsiflexion is usually the eliciting response. It's probably the, the last the last portion where someone's like, oh, nope, can't do that. Um, used for low back pain, sciatic pain, or just general nerve involvement. Some basic principles about using these tests are you should be aware of normal responses. So if they get that tingling or the numbness, know the symptoms, especially when they onset. Carefully monitor changes and instruct the patient on what to expect so they know how to describe it to you. Note the range of motion a lot. Of, like Think about the straight leg race test. Um, it could be disc or it could be nerve root depending on the angle of that extension of the hip or excuse me, the flexion of the hip. Um, note the type and the area of the pain, the end feels, and how the pain is increased or decreased. So even like the bowstring test when you um, put pressure into that popliteal surface or the popliteal fossa, um, is that going to increase or decrease the pain? Now sliding versus tensioning. Tensioning is nerve gliding to elongate the nerve bed. So that's going to be both ends. Oftentimes it's both both ends of um, the nerve and you're creating that tension. Whereas sliding is a little bit different. It's alternating combined movement so that one end is taut and the other segment is relaxed. So if we look about it earlier, combination of divergence and convergence. It's also known as flossing. Uh, flossing of the nerve to break up adhesions. So taking an example of that, um, let's take the median nerve as for an example. There's a greater excursion, meaning the greater movement of the nerve when you use um, wrist extension and elbow flexion. 
because wrist extension elongates the median nerve, but elbow flexion causes the divergence, so the shortening of the nerve. So you're actually getting greater movement when you do tension on one side and relaxing on the other. That was 12.6 millimeters, whereas if you do both wrist extension and elbow extension, which is going to be that tensioning technique, you're going to get 6.1 millimeters of movement. And you get peak nerve strain higher in tensioning techniques, which makes sense. I mean, you get a 2% increase, which when you think about it, when you're going to do a taut band, um, you're going to push on both sides, you're going to get that strain. So if you can see in the picture there, the top one is the tensioning technique and the bottom is the um, sliding. Sliding is less aggressive and acute. It is used in acute and post-operative conditions because you've got to remember it's not as p as high that peak um, force that um, or tension on it. So, like I said, when immobilization, you're going to get that lower than average amount. So you're going to start lower when you get out of that immobilization um, stage of healing. So less aggressive, acute, and post-operative, and then you you slowly advance it forward. Or higher. Tensioning is um, intraneural swelling and circulatory compromises. Often, most times, you're going to use it. Now, you do get that pumping effect, which is due to the difference in intraneural pressures and increases nerve hydration. So, that's the cool thing about that is that you are going to increase the hydration and the mobility of that nerve. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about upper limb tension tests. Um, this one specifically, we're going to start with um, this is the ulnar tension test where you're going to have your patient, this is going to be the end position, so you're in shoulder abduction, wrist extension, elbow flexion. So that's going to be the most um, tense. It's putting the most uh, strain on that ulnar nerve, and you're often going to get symptoms. Um, now we look at radial. Is there, It's kind of the opposite. We're going to do a little bit of abduction of the shoulder, but you are going to do wrist flexion, finger flexion, and elbow extension. But you're also going to have that Im the impact of the flexion of the neck. Um, so that's the radial one. Then you get the medial uh, tension test, which is exactly what this person is doing here in this picture, is you're going to be going away. So you get that abduction at 90 degrees, you get the um, elbow extension, and then you go ahead and extend the elbow, I mean, excuse me, the, the fingers and the wrist. And you often get that contralateral neck flexion, lateral flexion as well to elicit symptoms. Um, these are all can be used in rehabilitation. Excuse me, pro, uh, excuse me, rehabilitation um, programs to decrease nerve pain and to increase elongation and break up um, adhesions. So, if we take a quick look back at this ulnar tension test, um, there was a specific study that was done, and it showed that actually women are more uh, prone to having symptoms. Men had higher abduction, um, and you get a lot of the nerve symptoms that are elicited often most, most often, pardon me, with the wrist extension and finger flexion. And often the most um, common symptom to report is going to be that um, the stretching and the um, pain. Sorry, excuse me, Anda. Got rid of another slide there right in the middle of the presentation on accident. Well, um, I hope this clears up a little bit and I hope you learned a lot. Here are my work cited pages. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I've been practicing it this week and it's been a little confusing, but um, I'm looking forward to practicing it more and using it um, with my patients.